Good afternoon and welcome to the Minnesota Department of Health Stroke Education Series. This month we welcome Dr. Ganesh Asathambi, Director of Stroke Program for Alina Health, to talk to us about making acute stroke care accessible. Before we get started, let's cover housekeeping items and the MDH Stroke Program updates. This webinar is part of the MDH Stroke Program Monthly Education Series. Stay tuned to your emails for different educational opportunities each month. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. You can access all previously recorded webinars on our MDH YouTube playlist. Your lines have been muted upon entry. Please ask any questions by typing them into the chat throughout the presentation. If we don't get to all of your questions, we will try to address them on the follow-up email. Uh, just a quick agenda for today. We have program announcements. I will uh, show you the learning objectives, and then we have Dr. Asathambi's presentation. The 2022 Quality Improvement Awards for Hospitals and EMS Agencies launched this spring. Consider applying and showcasing your great QI and PI work if you haven't already. Deadline for the Hospital Awards is August 31st, and deadline for the EMS Awards is September 30th at by 5 p.m. Check out our website for further information and contact our program staff if you have any uh, further questions. Next month's educational opportunity event will be a pre-recorded opportunity, which will be emailed the week of our normal live presentations. Please stay tuned for that. And without further ado, here are the learning objectives. And I will turn it over to you, Dr. Asathambi. Sorry, hold on one second. I'm having technical issues. Sorry about that. Sorry about the delay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. My name is Ganesh Asathambi, neurologist. Uh, support the stroke program at Alina Health. Go to the next slide. I have nothing to disclose. And uh, next slide. And so the objectives for this discussion, um, making stroke care accessible, is to reveal, review rural urban disparities in stroke care. We'll address opportunities in caring for stroke patients in underserved communities and understand the need for establishing a stroke system of care. Next slide. So a bit of background first. Um, so stroke, as you may know, continues to be a leading cause of death and disability. Rates of IV thrombolysis are increasing across the United States over the past decade. Um, and coinciding with those increased rates of utilization, we are improving our door to needle times within 60 minutes and even 45 minutes. However, disparities remain, and largely between rural and urban stroke patients for acute stroke, particularly acute ischemic stroke care. For example, rural ischemic stroke patients were less likely to receive IV thrombolysis. And during the period of 2004 to 2010, rates of IV thrombolysis in urban regions had quadrupled as opposed to rural regions where it barely doubled. Rural stroke patients experienced higher in-hospital mortality rates associated with stroke as well. In addition, underlying risk factors among rural Americans uh, that predispose them to a higher risk of cere cerebrovascular disease include high blood pressure, use of tobacco, and abuse of alcohol. Next slide. In addition, rural Americans tend to have lower knowledge of stroke and heart attack risk factors, and there seems to be transportation barriers. As you may know, within Minnesota, particularly in the winter time, travel times may be longer through air or by ground just because of our cold weather. In addition, to rural disparities, the racial and ethnic disparities exist as well. For example, rural African Americans as well as rural Hispanics are less likely to receive high quality stroke care in the immediate setting. 
and they are also the least knowledgeable about stroke and heart disease. Interestingly, while still not where we expect it to be, stroke awareness among urban Americans approaches 60%, much higher than our rural American counterparts. But of course, 60% is not ideal either. Next slide. So rural hospitals in the United States tend to be much smaller. Nearly half of all rural hospitals have fewer than 25 beds. And associated with this, there are less frequent use of IV thrombolysis for ischemic stroke. There's twice the odds of IV thrombolysis utilization in urban settings. And surprisingly, about 65% of small hospitals reported no use of IV thrombolysis. And small hospitals were defined as an average of 95 beds. So not the less than 25 beds, but actually near 100. And among these hospitals that reported no use of IV thrombolysis, about 15% of uh, stroke patients hospitalized in the United States were admitted to these hospitals. Next slide. So looking more closely or in depth, and this is in 2010, the proportion of the United States population. Back in 2010, we had the establishment of primary stroke center certification that started in about 2003, 2004. And by that time, there was no uh, promotion of an acute stroke ready hospitals designation. So when we looked at primary stroke center, uh, uh, center accessibility, we noticed that on the far right of the screen, you'll, you'll see that patients within suburban areas as well as rural areas that a very high proportion, 91% of suburban residents and 99% of rural residents were over an hour away from a primary stroke center. Very alarming. And hopefully over the, 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 the past decade or since 2010, we've made great progress, but yet there continues to be efforts that we need to collectively do. Next slide, please. What you'll see here is a comparison of the disparity between rural hospitals and urban hospitals in the utilization of IV thrombolysis. At the top, what you'll see, the top map of the United States in 2004, you'll, know, you'll notice in particular Minnesota, there's, a, there's a, the number 100 on it. That means that there was the maximum, most disparate ability to provide care for stroke patients in rural communities, meaning that urban stroke patients were getting far better access to care than what rural communities had at that time. Then it's 2004. The bottom map is in 2010, while there was still improvement, there was still quite a high disparity in the ability for Minnesotans to receive care in rural areas. Next slide. So what is associated with the lower accessibility among non-urbanites? So these patients tend to have lower income, a lower education level, more frequently are uninsured, oftentimes have Medicare or Medicaid eligibility, tend to use healthcare less frequently, and ultimately have fewer healthcare resources. So the question comes up, is the rural stroke patient, do they belong to a unique underserved minority group that we don't typically associate with? like race or ethnicity or age or sex, is the rural stroke patient a minority group of its own? Next slide, please. So in 2013, the Brain Attack Coalition had proposed a nomenclature and designation for establishing acute stroke-ready hospitals. This could inevitably lead to the formation of, as the base of any stroke system of care and was uh, does it was proposed for hospitals that tended to have fewer than 100 beds. So ultimately, what are some of the types of care elements that acute stroke ready hospitals could help perform? Well, it could identify what type of clinical situation the patient is coming in with to help stabilize vital signs, try to diagnose a stroke type, whether it tends to be ischemic or by radiographic interpretation, hemorrhagic, assess whether they could be eligible for IV thrombolysis if there are bleeding 
hemorrhagic complications, ad addressing any potential coagulopathies, like if the patient has uh, warfarin or other systemic anticoagulation or low platelet count, things like that, and to help with non-interventional means to help address elevated intracranial pressures or even treat seizures. Next slide. So in 2011, right before the uh, proposal of acute stroke ready designation, 20% of Americans lacked timely access to IV thrombolytic capable hospitals. And since then, with educational efforts, professional organizations, more collective uh, uh, efforts uh, across communities, about 96% of Americans were uh, within an hour of IV thrombolytic capable hospitals, and almost all Americans were within two hours of IV thrombolytic capable hospitals. And this access is related to any stroke center or center with telestroke capability. Next slide. So is Minnesota winning? I chuckle at using that, uh, that or asking that question, but I do truly think that Minnesota is winning in our ability to provide great stroke care. As of February of 2021, 89% of Minnesotans are within 30 minutes of a designated hospital that is able to uh, provide IV thrombolysis or um, uh, some sort of acute stroke care. So overall, that's 116 116 hospitals designated as a primary stroke center, comprehensive stroke center, thromb uh, thrombectomy capable stroke center, or an acute stroke ready hospital. And of those 116, 93, 93 are acute stroke ready hospital designated. Next slide. So if we compare what Minnesota is able to offer to neighboring states, you'll notice that, well, there aren't as many dots in North Dakota. Next slide. Iowa, next slide. Wisconsin, next slide. Arkansas, and I only used Arkansas as a as an example of some uh, a state where uh, where stroke tends to be much more prevalent in the south. Um, but they uh, and, and next slide and Michigan. So many states in the upper Midwest. Um, have nothing to compete with us as a state. We are doing a phenomenal job in providing access to Minnesotans. Next slide. So with the early adoption of acute stroke ready hospital in Minnesota, this is actually something that our own Al Sai, when he was with us, was able to present at the International Stroke Conference a few years ago. So when the Brain Attack Coalition had proposed the designation of acute stroke ready, the Minnesota stroke system was then launched in 2013 in order to organize and recognize hospitals that are able to deliver acute stroke treatment. So again, 93 hospitals currently are designated as that acute stroke ready. So the goal of the system was to increase access to acute stroke treatment um, and improve outcomes for stroke patients. So the MDH designated acute stroke ready hospitals according to several criteria that the Brain Attack Coalition had proposed. Um, and what, what uh, Al had been able to lead in, in the study was to determine between the establishment of acute stroke ready and 2017, how frequently we were able to treat patients with IV thrombolysis. So you'll see kind of on the x-axis early adopters, which were hospitals that de were designated acute stroke ready as early as 2014, late adopters who were designated in 2016, and then never designated, so never sought acute stroke ready designation. You'll see in the bar graphs that the early adopters had a significant increase in the utilization of IV thrombolysis for ischemic stroke. So that was statistically significant from about 14% to about 21%. But then late adopters, while there was an increase numerically, did not have the statistically significant uh, change in time uh, because of their late adoption. And while visually, um, never designated hospitals had what looks like an increase in IV thrombolysis utilization, there's no statistically significant improvement in its use. The trends in treatment were ultimately the most noticeable among the early adopting acute stroke ready hospitalizations. And interestingly, through this analysis, what we learned was that 
the, the hospitals that were never designated actually never used IV thrombolysis within the three to four and a half hour window, which is typically in community standard, what we typically uh, uh, use as the upper limit, four and a half hours as the uh, time to treat with IV thrombolysis. So what was concluded from this study was that trends, again, were treat and treatment for IV thrombolysis was highest among the early adopting uh, acute stroke ready hospitals. And um, these sustained increases suggest that similar increases will be seen probably by now among those later adopting hospitals. And that implementation of a statewide system of care, um, namely the adoption of standards and hospital designation is a driver for sustained increases in treatment rates. So a, a, a nice thing to advertise for uh, not only MDH, but also for Minnesota and our ability to provide acute stroke care to our uh, Minnesotans. Next slide. So if we're able to compare what an acute stroke ready hospital can do uh, to a primary stroke center, ultimately, we want to be able to have quick response times, be able to revise protocols on an annual basis, be able to provide education to our EMS services, have written protocols for emergency departments, have accessible brain imaging um, during all hours of the day. And if there's no ability to have on-site stroke expertise using telemedicine uh, in order to ascertain if we're able to help um, provide timely access to a neurologist or someone else that could help sort through what the, the best course of treatment are for patients with acute neurological change. Next slide. So with telemedicine and how it has evolved over the past several years, um, telemedicine is a wonderful way to provide care to stroke patients in rural communities when local or onsite expertise is insufficient. It is actually a cost-effective way when compared to usual care, which is lack of subspecialty expertise. And especially when it's related to the pandemic and um, whether it's staffing, bed issues, or people reluctant to seek medical care in the city and wanna go more close to home, uh, being able to expand coverage to subacute stroke and to counsel on secondary prevention and rehabilitation, uh, telemedicine uh, would be very useful. And um, what we've seen with the advent of telestroke is improved door to needle times. Next slide. Of course, there are very many stakeholders that are required in order to help develop a system of care. And you'll see that on the list, this is not completely exclusive. There are many others that are required to help formalize uh, a successful system of care when it comes for from non-designated acute stroke ready hospitals to acute stroke ready hospitals to primary stroke and comprehensive and thrombectomy capable stroke centers. So next slide. What uh, these arrows in this diagram are actually going in one way and I would actually propose that in the top row where we are triaging patients at acute stroke ready hospitals or um, smaller hospitals that in situations where patients come in with ischemic stroke symptoms or stroke symptoms altogether, that there are opportunities, particularly with the pandemic and um, bed issues and things like that and competing disease processes that, um, that ultimately could, could or would need higher level of care, that patients with the advent of telestroke can be taken care of more locally if they don't receive thrombolysis or require more high level interventions. So um, for patients that receive IV thrombolysis or have a large vessel occlusion, transferring them to higher level of care to stroke centers, of course, makes sense where we're able to provide that level of care that some or many hospitals are not able to do. And then of course, with intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage doing the same thing. But with the ability of telemedicine, we're able to, in theory, successfully provide acute stroke care for patients that don't receive acute reperfusion therapies. Next slide, please. So to conclude, rural, rural urban inequities still exist in stroke care. I do think that Minnesota is ahead of the game and should serve as an example for the entire country. The goal is to minimize this disparity, right? And um, ultimately having opportunities to establish and increase the number of acute stroke ready hospitals 
Uh, and if you if, if one is an acute stroke ready hospital to continue to work on the quality efforts uh, to make sure that we're we're all committed to stroke care for all of our uh, all of our patients. And to be a part of a system of stroke care allows for an easy continuum of care. And so what that meaning uh, means is uh, uh, aggressive partnerships with professional communication, professional and community education to help increase the potential rate of acute ischemic stroke therapies and other, stroke interventions, and then also being able to increase public awareness of the importance of time in seeking medical attention. That's all I have. And so next slide, it's just my contact information. Thank you again for having me uh, join you in this session three years in a row. I must be doing hopefully something right. Um, otherwise, I am open to some questions if there are any. Thank you again, Dr. Asadambi. Uh, anybody have any questions, please place them in the chat and we will get them very quickly here to, to Dr. Asadambi and otherwise you can press star six to unmute your line as well. And give a pe people a chance to type. Not that fast of a type riffer. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? One more minute here. Um, while we're doing that, I'm actually going to have my colleague place the uh, survey link in the chat. Remember to click on the chat bubble in order to view the chat box. Upon completion, you will receive a link. Uh, evaluation link, she's putting, just put it in there along with the access code in case you need it um, for the survey evaluation when you will receive your 0.5 contact hour. All right, if anybody has any questions that we may not get to today, please feel free to send them to uh, health.stroke at state.mn.us. Oh, here we go. Um, Dr. Asasambi, did the TPA replacement program go into effect during this study, which may have eliminated the cost barrier? Good question for which an answer I don't have. That's okay. Wonderful. Thank you for the question, Laura. I appreciate it. Anyone else? All right. Well, Dr. Asasambi, I can't thank you enough again for the great presentation, especially on um, on our rural inequities and, and it's something we work hard to, to help solve in the state. And like you said, hopefully it seems like we seem to be doing a good job. So, and that's uh, all we seem to have for today. Please stay tuned to your email for month monthly educational opportunities. Stay well and take care. Thanks everyone, take care.